Okay, welcome everyone to this week's class on Midrash, right? The weekly Pedasha through Midrashic lens, okay? To start today's class, um, Adele asked last week if I can address the question of the different books of the Midrashim. So in the first few minutes, we'll do a little bit of an introduction before we look at some Midrashim on Pedashat Pinehas take a look at the different books of Midrashim. So before I even speak about that, it's important to know, to recognize the difference between Midrash Ada and Midrash Halacha, okay? There are Midrashim that are considered um, Agada, like telling, like stories, and the Midrash Halacha, okay? And if I could just open up here in front of you from the Da'at website as fantastic resources, and it gives different types of midrashim as you see here, okay? There are midrashim halachot, like a book called the Mechilta, the Sifra, the Sifre. There are different types of midrashim called midrash halacha. Uh, if any of you are interested, I'm welcome to give one of my classes on Midrash Halacha. That was actually my master's in college in uh, YU. My master's degree was actually in um, Talmud on Midrash Halacha. Uh, then what we're studying this year, this summer, is Midrash Agada. Okay, those are, you know, um, stories and parables. Right? That's what we're studying this summer. The difference between Midrash Halacha and Midrash Agada, um, if anyone wants to chime in, and if you think you know the difference, you know, welcome to, uh, to chime in and, and answer that. You know, the difference between Midrash Halacha and Midrash Agada is Midrash Agada is non-binding, right? If the Hachamim tell me a Midrash, I don't have an obligation of any sort to quote unquote, follow that Midrash. When it comes to Midrash Halakha, when it comes to looking at Pesukim and deriving Halakhot from that, if the Halakha is according to that opinion, we do have an obligation to follow that Midrash, that Midrash Halakha. So Midrash Halakha and Midrash Agada are two different types, right? In both of them, there's something being derived from the Pesukim, but one, there's a, there's a lesson being learned. In the other, there's a Halakha being derived. So it's important, and we could, in one of the classes this summer, like I said, take a look at a few examples of that so you can get an idea of the difference between the two. Right of the difference between Midrash Halakha and Midrash Agada. Um, so just again to answer Adele's question, look at the different Midrash Agada. Right, I pulled up this book last week called Midrash Rabbah, but there are many different Midrashim. There's Midrashim called um, Midrash uh, Hagadol. We'll look at that today. There's Midrashim on Mishle, on Tehilim. There's a collection called Pesikta Rabate, Pesikta de Ravkana, um, Yalkut Shimoni is something that's well known. So there are many different Midrashim. Last year, last week, we spoke about the dates, right? You have some Midrashim that were written much earlier on, and some Midrashim that are written as late as the 12th century, okay? So in today's class, I'd like to continue on now to take a look at Midrashim on this week's Perasha. Okay? Midrashim on Perashat Pinehas. As usual, are there any questions? Anyone have any questions? Um, please uh, feel free to ask. You could chat it in. You can, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. If you have any questions you know, on what I just said, um, please feel free to ask. Um, if not, I'll just continue on to Midrashim on this week's Perasha. So, 
At the end of last week's parasha, we read about Pinehas's action. Pinehas, ben Elazar ben Anakohen, we read last week that there was this individual, his name we don't know about in the end of last week's parasha, but he takes a Midianit in the eyes of Moshe and Bnei Israel, and he sleeps with her. He does an action with her, and he flagrantly opposes what God wants, what Moshe wants. Bnei Israel are doing Avodah Zarah with Baal Peor, as you see here in the Pesukim. And now it says, Vayar Pinehas ben Elazar ben Arona Kohen, Vayakom itoch Aida, Vayikah Romach Beado. Now, important, I repeat again, we're reading the Pesukim because in order to understand the Midrashim we're going to read today, they only make sense in the context of the story. Like I mentioned last week, right? If we want to understand the Midrashim as having a deeper message, we have to understand the Peshat in order to understand the Derash. So he gets up and he takes a Romach, he takes a spear in his hand. Okay, he takes, he stabs both of them, right? The way I understand it, him through his back and her through her belly. And he stops this plague. And there are 24,000 Israelites that die from this plague. What happens in the beginning of this week's parasha? Two things. One is we're told what the reward was of Pinehas. And two is we're told who was killed. Okay, by the Moshe Pinehas ben Elazar ben Arona Kohen, Heshivet Hamati me'al b'nei Yisrael. Pinehas, he um, returned or turned away my wrath from b'nei Yisrael. This is the phrase we need a lot for today. Be'kan'o'et kin'ati betocham. When he was, when he acted in zealousness for me, and I didn't wipe out b'nei Yisrael. Therefore, I'm giving him my berit of shalom. And some of you may have learned this already this morning, possibly, or in a class this week so far, that he's granted shalom, and he's granted for him and his children a berit keunat olam. Why? Tahat asher because he acted in zealousness for God, by Chaper, and he did a kapara, he atoned for Bnei Yisrael. And then we're told the names of those that were killed. B'shem ish Yisrael hamukeh, asher uka et amidyani, zimri ben salu. Okay, and one of the midrashim we might get to today, I'm, I'm hoping we will, we're going to learn about this name, zimri ben salu. Right, this is the a nasi for Shimon. And the woman is Kozbi Batsur. She is a princess of Midian. Now let's take a look now at the first Midrash on this week's Perasha. I know last week there were Hebrew English translations. I apologize, not every Midrash on Safaria has the Hebrew English. So for this, I will read and explain. Pinehas ben Elazar, this is in Bemidbar Raba. Pinehas ben Elazar ben Arona Kohen. Amar Kadosh Baruch Hu, says God. Bedin hu shiitol secharo. God, as if said, it's only according to law that he deserves, Pinehas deserves a reward. Asks the Midrash, right, what's this reward that he gets? Lachen emor hininin onoten lot periti shalom. He gets the, the gift of peace. His, my berit of peace. Says the Midrash, Gadol hashalom shenatan lefinehas. Great is the shalom, is the peace that Pinehas got. She'en ha'olam mitnaheg ella b'shalom. That the world does not run or does not behave, right? Minaheg is behavior, but it doesn't run except for with shalom. 
Stop there for a moment. Think for a moment and reflect the fact that he gets this gift of shalom, that he's, it's given to him, right? Now we're going to reflect for a moment about what Pinehas did. Think about his actions. Think about what it takes to get up and stand up in front of others. And he had to go murder two human beings, right? Is that shalom? Is that shalom? Just think about the reward. He went and he murdered, uh, uh, and we don't know till later that it was a, it was a chieftain and a princess. It was a nasi, right? And this, the daughter of the king of Midian. We don't know that till later. But is that shalom? So you have to ask yourself, what is this first midrash on the perasha telling us already by saying, Gadol HaShalom Shenatan Lefinehas. It's a gift. Firstly, you have to realize how the word shalom is being used. It's like, I give you a gift. I gift you a present. Something physical. Look at the way the Midrash is, is, is written. Gadol HaShalom Shenatan Lefinehas. Great is the shalom that was given to Pinehas. Like you give someone like a phone or you give them something I'm giving it to you he handed it over to him and says to me dash this is so great let's take a look at maybe why Pinehas got Shalom let's see that the world functions through peace Shalom and the Torah is Shalom as it's written in Mishle, its ways of, ways of pleasantness and all of its paths are peace. Continues in Midrash, if a person comes back from the road, from, from a, a trip, we ask him, Shalom, how are you doing? Uh, and where do we know that from, by the way? Where do we know this idea of, of greeting people? Right, we greet people with names, you know, in Megillat Rut, right? Boaz tells his workers, Adonai imachem. Right, may God be with you. And they answer, Yabarechecha Adonai. So even though the word Shalom is not used there, we'll see that even God's name is known as Shalom. Be'im v'chen shaharit shu'alino Shalom. In the morning, we ask a person, how are they doing, right? There's halachot that we have. You might know this. There's halachot that we have in the morning with using that word shalom. Can you say shalom to somebody in the morning when you see them before you've prayed? Why might not you be able to? Because God's name is shalom. So maybe I can't say shalom to you if I see you in the morning before I prayed. This is one of my favorite ones. Shema in the evening ends with, the, with Shalom. If you look at the Beracha, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Nice to have it in front of us. If you look at the Beracha in the at night when we're praying Arbit, if you look just trying to pull this up. I think it's great, always great to have text in front of you because even though you might know some of it by heart, it's nice because we're talking about wording here. Just a nice lesson to learn. Since we're talking about wording here, it's important when you're, when you're dealing with wording to look at the wording itself because you gain a lot more by looking at it. Here we go. Here is the Kol Yaakov, Sidur. Look at the um, beracha that we have. The, the last beracha at night before the Amida, which is considered the last beracha of Brikot Kiyat Shema. Hashkivenu avinu le shalom. Look how many times it's going to be used in this beracha. Ve'ha'amidenu ma'kinu la'chaim tovim u shalom. I'm going to come back to that word hayim later. Ufros alenu sukat shalomecha. Right, we're asking God for his shalom. Go on further. 
ushmor setenu uboenu and watch over us when we come in and when we leave, right? Lehayim ushalom ki el shomerenu umasilenu ata mikovah halai neilu mishan shome Israel. We end with. But this is a beracha of shalom. Right? Think about the idea that the Midrash wants you to realize that when you're praying at night, you're ending with shalom. Where else do we end with shalom? You can chime in if you'd like. Where else do we end with shalom? Something else that we end Amida. with Siri. Amida. The Amidah, beautiful. That's what the Midrash says. A tefillah, hotmin be shalom. Our tefillah, we end our tefillah with shalom. Bibidkat koanim hotmin be shalom. And bidkat koanim as well. Let's go back to that in the Sidur, right? And we know it. Again, looking inside, important. Right? Sim shalom. And we end, by the way, not only do we end the Amidah with the Berachav Shalom, the last word is Bashalom. And that's why, by the way, we end, even though the Amidah is really over there, we put Oseh Shalom Yim Romav. We end, even though we're ending with more words following the last Beracha, remember that the last Beracha really ends with Hamibarech Moise Bashalom Amen. Even though we're adding things later, we still are careful to make sure we add in Ose Shalom Yim Romav, so that we're still ending the Amidah Be Shalom, even though we added things after the last Beracha. So the Hachamim wanted us to still end with Shalom. And Birkat Kohanim, how does that end? Ve'yasem Lecha Shalom. Also with Shalom. Amar Ribi Shimon ben Halafta. En keli mahazik beracha ella shalom. Shene'emar, Adonai oz le'amo yiten. Adonai yibarech et amo bashalom. Right? Everything needs to have peace. Your home needs to have peace. Everything needs shalom. Let's go back to the question then. What was the goal of this midrash by attaching all of this with pinehas? You have to ask yourself that question. The midrash here doesn't actually say anything about why he was given shalom. Why Pinehas? And I think the Mepharashim, the commentators, address that question by saying that, by saying, <laughs> by saying that Pinehas needed it. Think about these two factors. One is the inner peace, right? You just murdered two people. You're not sure if you did the right thing. You're not sure if you were doing this on behalf of others, right? What's your motive? When you're granted shalom, and God tells you, I'm giving you the berit of shalom, God is in essence saying, you can still be a peaceful person and still act in a way that's necessary in order to ensure that other people are taken care of. So he's, he's actually was, was working on behalf of God. It's interesting, right? You might say, oh, a peaceful person doesn't go to war. Like you say, a humble person doesn't lead. Not true. Moshe Rabbeinu, prime example, he was the most humble of all, and he led. Humility doesn't mean not leading. Being peaceful does not mean not taking charge. Secondly, you have the outer peace, right, of people who may want to kill, kill him. Think about Shevet Shimon. Think about the, 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 the people of Midian, the king of Midian, right? His daughter was killed. He needs shalom. And here I think the Midrash is telling us Shalom through Torah. When we act with Shalom with Torah, who was the prime example of this? Who was the prime example of Shalom in Hazal? 
Who's the prime example? Who is Rod Ohev Shalom and Rodev Shalom? Come on. Aaron. What? Aaron. You say Aaron, I'll say his grand Pihas's grandfather. I'm gonna okay. say that purposely, right? You're right that it's Aaron, exactly. And I'm gonna say his grandfather, and I'm using that term because the Torah, how does the Midrash start? Pinehas ben El Azad ben Aharon HaKohen. And what Beracha were the Kohanim asked to do? The Beracha we just asked about, Birkat Kohanim. We were just speaking about Birkat Kohanim. So the Kohanim asked to pursue peace. His grandfather pursued peace. Actually, let me bring up another Midrash about his grandfather. Because it is important. So much so, I gotta find it here, that the Shevatim come and they try to bug Pinhas. They say, At nitkar Zimri, when Zimri was killed, Amdua Shevatim Alav, the Shevatim stood against Pinhas, the Amru Reiten ben Putielze, Shepitem Avi Imo Agalim la Abudat Kohavim. Harag Nasim Yisrael. Look, this, this Pinehas' grandfather created Avodah Zarah. He created the Egel, right? They make fun of him. They're using, he is trying to stop Avodah Zarah, but they're saying, look, your grandfather, look what he did. And you came and you killed the Nasim Yisrael. Therefore, the Katu of the Pasuk, gave him Yehus. It gave him like, didn't just call him Pinehas. It called him Pinehas bin El Azar bin Aharon HaKohen. said he is a person that's Hashuv, that's important. Good. Now, without further ado, I'm hoping you thought I would address this question in today's um, Midrash class. And if not, you know, here it is. The other Midrash that I really want to spend time on today, and I want to make sure we have enough time for it, is the famous Midrash of Pinehas Hu Eliyahu. I like to spend some time on that. Because if you look over here, we're going to see some crossover between this concept of Shalom and then addressing this question of Pinehas Hu Eliyahu. Let's look at that Midrash now. Um, the Midrash is actually what's called Midrash Hagadol. I cannot date this Midrash if you're asking me when does the Midrash about Pinehas and Eliyahu, when does the date from, I can't tell you. I could only tell you that the Midrash quotes it in the name of Resh Lakish. Right, the Amora Resh Lakish. So it's a question, when does this Midrash, we all know this famous idea of Pinehas is Eliyahu. At every Berit Milah, right, the song, songs that we sing incorporate that into our tunes, right, Pinehas or Eliyahu. But let's look at this Midrash. Amar Lakish, hu Pinehas, hu Eliyahu. Now we all know that part of the Midrash. What we may not realize is the next part of the Midrash. You, it sounds like he's saying you Pinehas, not you Eliyahu. You Pinehas, you brought peace between me and Bnei Israel. You stopped the possible onslaught of many more of Bnei Israel. So in the future as well, in the future too, you will do that as well. In the future, you, Pinehas, who is Eliyahu, in the future you will bring peace to Bnei Israel. Now, this is probably one of the more classic Midrashim that I was referring to last week that I said in Rambam, we can't understand almost all or if most Midrashim literally. We have to understand 
the deeper message of Hazal. And that's the question. What is the message here? Baba, I see you smiling here. This is probably one of... And isn't that what we saw, why Pinchas did what he did? Right. But I'm going to address an even deeper question over here that I hope by the time we finish with this, you'll have a greater understanding, even for myself. I thought I understood all the particulars of the connection, right? Let's start with the simple connection. The most simple connection between Pinahas and Eliyahu is textual, right? Like Baba just said, more Baba just said, Kano kineti ladonai Let's go back to our original story for a moment. The story we started with of Pinehas, where it says that Pinehas acted in zealousness. Verse 11, Pinehas ben Elazar no Kohen, he returned, turned away my wrath, bekano et kinati betocham. By acting in zealousness, in his zealousness, for me on my behalf. And I did not wipe out B'nai Israel in my zealousness. Right? God was acting in zealousness because of the Avodah Zarah, and he started wiping out parts of B'nai Israel. Now he stops because of Pinhas' zealotry. Right? Tahat Asher Kine Lilohav. Because he acted in his zealousness to atone for B'nai Israel. Now let's fast forward to the story of Eliyahu and Avi. And I'd like to give you a little backdrop. A little backdrop to this story. Eliyahu and Avi just had the famous showdown on Hara Karmel, where he convinced, quote unquote, B'nai Israel that Adonai Hu Elohim. Adonai Hua Elohim. However, a moment later, after they slaughtered all the false prophets, the wicked Izevel wants to kill Eliyahu Hanavi. So Eliyahu is all upset and he runs away and he's forced to eat and he walks 40 days and 40 nights to Har Sinar Horeb. And he comes to Me'ara, and God asks him, what are you doing here? And it's crucial, everyone, to understand the backdrop of this story, to understand the connection between Pinehas and Eliyahu. Vayomer, kano kneti ladonai sevaot. I am moved by zeal and zealousness for Adonai Elohe sevaot. For Yod Kebavke. Ki Azevu Beritecha Bene Israel. Because they left your Berit. Et Mizbehotecha Harasu. Ve et Nevi Echa Harerube Harev. Because they left your Berit. And they destroyed your Avoda. Sorry. And they destroyed your Mizbechot. They left, they didn't destroy the Abu Dazara, they destroyed your Mizbechot. And so I'm left alone. There's no one left. Nobody is left. The famous story goes that God tells Eliyahu, come out in front of God by the mountain and God is, you know, coming by and he comes with a huge ruach gedola, right? Um, a mighty wind and God's not in the wind. And then God comes in an earthquake and God's not in the earthquake. And then God comes in the fire and God's not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a... Sorry, I, I read that literally. A kol demamadaka. Right? There was this soft sound. And God, Eliyahu, hears it, hears all this, and he and he and he covers him his face. And again, God says, What are you doing here? And he says, I am zealous for God. 
and I'm the only one left. They all left your bidi. They all left your, your, uh, your covenant. Okay? So on the surface level, who else in Tanakh is zealous for God? Says the Hachamim, Eliyahu is like Pinehas. But there's something much deeper and a little bit different about these two people. Right? I don't want to answer. What's the difference between Pinehas and Eliyahu? We're comparing them. And that's why we have to understand why the Midrash says they're the same person. Are they really the same person in the Tanakh? Are they? Did they do the same things? Did they react the same way? Are they saying the same things? You have to ask yourself that question. I, I, I think that Pinchas did what he did from a belief that Bnei Israel are not bad, and they did not. It was just a mo momentary lapse. And Eliyahu believes that it's, it's lost. That's it. There's nothing to do. So I think their motives, their zealousy, the motive for their zealousy is, is totally different. Perfect. And I'll even add to what you just said. If you look carefully at the Pesukim, and this is very important when you're reading Midrash, if you look at the Pasuk, it never says in the Pasuk that Pinehas got up in zealousness. It only uses the word later that God says that he acted in zealousness, that he used Kinah. It never uses that word with Pinehas himself. He never actively says, I'm acting in zealousness. And he never actually says, Bnei Yisrael left the Berit. Actually, look at the difference over here. Pinehas is given a berit. He's handed over the berit. Right? He's told, you get the berit of shalom. You get the berit of keunat olam. Although, to be fair, you can say that they're a little bit different. Right? Pinehas is more in the earlier stages of Bnei Israel when the berit is being strengthened and being started. Right? This is the 40th year. The Berit is starting now. Eliyahu is living a little bit later when maybe he looks at this Berit and he says this Berit is diminishing. Right? Pinehas did something and he acted in zealousness and he took care of business. Bnei Yisrael should have realized what he did and been grateful and they're not grateful. Similar to Eliyahu, his own life. I gave them an opportunity. I showed them who is God. And then they're still out to get me. So to compare them that way, I'm not sure when I was looking at last night how fair it is. But it is important to see the contrast. It is important to realize that Eliyahu is saying that everything is gone. And Pinehas is not saying that. Although maybe one is a commentary on the other. Maybe Eliyahu's story tells us more in the way it's written. Remember, every story in the Tanakh is written a specific way with specific wording for a purpose. Right? The only way we know about the story is through the Navi writing it. Was the Navi writing this down in a way for us to think about Pinehas? I don't know. But here's what you have to ask yourself. Pinehas hu Eliyahu. That's what Midrash says. And the Midrash says something even more than that. It says, Pinehas gave shalom. It didn't say that Eliyahu did bring shalom. It says the future Eliyahu will bring shalom. Think about that for a moment. I'm going to pause there for a moment so you could grasp that. Pinehas brought shalom. And in the future, Eliyahu and Navi will bring shalom. Not the Eliyahu that we know in Navi, the Eliyahu of the future. And for that, we have to ask, ask ourselves, how does the Midrash view the Eliyahu 
of the Navi, of Sebe Melachim. Not Eliyahu of Le'atid Lavo. Not Eliyahu of the future. Um, I, think, I think what the Midrash really wants to tell us is that um, everything that Eliyahu went through in this episode is to show him that there is a different way. And that different way is the way of Pinchas. Precisely. So in order to, to do that, by the way, we have to see what the Midrash does with the Pesukim, okay? Because later on, there's a Pasuk about Eliyahu Navi that says the following. I'm going to read it. It's in Seven Malachi. In Seven Malachi, I'm actually going to stop before I read this Pasuk and give you a little backdrop. In this Perek in Malachi, God tells the Kohanim through Malachi, right, that I appointed you as the leaders. Let me see if I can bring it up here on Safari. I think it'll be a little bit easier to read it. Oh, one second. Hold on, bear with me a moment. If there's any questions until now, actually, while I'm opening this up, it's probably a good time to ask questions, which I welcome. When I get silence, you know, like it's in school, like everyone either fully understands or is a bit lost. So I never know. Let's go, Malachi, here we go. I'm hoping also for everyone today, the connection is good. Um, here we go. So in Seben Malachi, it says in Perek Bet, I gave you a mitzvah, you kohanim. Im lo tishmeu, if you don't listen and give kavod to me, then I'm going to destroy you. And I'm going to send you evil. Vidatem, and he says, Ki shilachti alechem et ha-mitzvah azot, liyot beriti et levi. I made a berit with shevet levi. And look what the pasuk says. Beriti Hayeta ito hahayim vehashalom. I made a berit with him, with the Levi. Hayim and shalom. Life and peace. Ba'etenem lo mora ba'yira eni upene shemini hato. And Ibn Ezra here brings two different opinions on who ito is. Is it Aharona Kohen or is it Pinehas? Who was granted Hayim and Shalom? The Midrash is saying that this is talking about Pinahas. This Pasuk, Beriti Hayeta Ito, Hayim Shalom, is about Pinahas. Pinahas got not only Shalom, peace, but he got Hayim. Says the Midrash, Pinahas lived on and on. Pinahas was living for hundreds of years. There's actually a strange pasuk. I'm trying to remember. I think it's in Sever Shoftim, but maybe it's in Yoshua. I'm trying to remember. That says that Pinehas was still in front of Elazar Kohen, right? And it uses the name Pinehas there. I, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, not Pinehas, not Elazar. I'm trying to remember the exact pasuk. Um, but there's a pasuk that talks about Pinehas. Later on in Chumash, later on in Tanakh. And if it's talking about Pinchas, how is he living hundreds of years later? So the Midrash looks at this Pasuk, look carefully at this Pasuk, and says, It, it is in Sefer Shoftim, in Pilegash Bagiva, okay, before the third battle, I think, when, where it says, um, um, gosh, I just lost it, I just had it and I lost it. Um, it's in right. so on that pasuk that Pinchas is there, there's a machloket. Maybe it's the name of the of the of the of the, of the position, 
right? They called it Pinhas. Maybe the story happened earlier, but it was put later in the, in the Sefer. Or like the Midrash says, that Pinhas was given Hayim. That Pinhas lived on and on and on. And later on was Eliyahu. Again, we can't understand that literally. But let me stress that. I don't think that Ambam would say the Hazal did not want us to understand that literally. They want us to understand the message. That now look carefully over here. You take a character like Pinehas, who got Shalom, and let's say he was granted Hayim. And now you take another individual that's very similar to him, who acts in zealousness, but is also somehow different than Pinehas. And now you end this same sefer of Malachi and you say, after all the bad that's going to happen to Bnei Israel, zichru Torat Moshe Avdi, Behorev. Where was the Torah given? On Har Chorev, on Har Sinai. Where was Eliyahu claiming zealotry for God? At Har Chorev. The Midrash, and I want to stress this, that in my study of Midrash throughout the years, I've realized how carefully Midrash reads Pesukim and Tanakh. It, you can look at it as a chart, and it finds the connecting dots throughout the Tanakh to connect different stories, different characters, people's lives, and it, and it just tells you that there are these markers Imagine these red flags, and it says, oh, Kin'ah, Pinchas, Kin'ah, Eliyahu, Chorev, Eliyahu, Chorev, Har Sinai, the Torah being given, the Berit. Then you have Berit with Eliyahu. You say that Eliyahu says they left the Berit. Who is Berit? The Berit of Pinehas. And how does this book end? And keep in mind, this is the last of the Nevuot of Am Yisrael, right? Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. What are they told? What are the last things that Bnei Yisrael told through Nevuah? Hine anochi sholeach lachem et Eliyah hanavi lifne bo yom Adonai hagadov ha'anorah. Eliyah is going to come back. Beheshiv lev avot albanim. Look at that word. Even those that are not careful readers of Tanakh, I'll show it to you on my screen. Beheshiv lev avot albanim veleb banim alavotam pen avov hiketiet aret herem. Says the Pasuk, he's going to return B'nai Israel to God so that I don't kill them. Someone chat in or chime in here. What does this remind us of? The idea of returning B'nai Israel to God so God doesn't wipe them out. Same words. Beheshiv. Lehashiv. That's the exact word that's used by God when he says over here, Heshiv et hamati me'al B'nai Israel. Pinhas turned away my wrath. Now, how? He turns Bnei Israel back to me. So Eliyahu ultimately is going to turn Bnei Israel back to God. Says our Midrash, how so? And I don't have this Midrash in front of me, I'm sorry, but you all may know this Midrash. It's in the Zohar. It says that God, quote unquote, I don't know if he punishes him, but he makes Eliyahu come to every Berit Milah. And what does that mean? I'm sure many of you have heard this. Eliyahu is at every Berit Milah. We have Kiseh ve Eliyahu. This is, it's not, and we all look at it as something, you know, wow, Eliyahu is here. It was in its, a punishment in a way. But not a punishment. It was a way of showing Eliyahu and Avi, you said that everyone left the Berit. Now I'm going to quote unquote as if make you attend every Berit Milah to see that Bnei Israel did not leave the Berit. 
they kept the berit. I want you to take that in for a moment. When you go to a berit milah, or when you hear a berit milah on Zoom, yes, I know it's not so easy to attend berit milah these days, <laughs> but when you attend the berit milah on Zoom, so, and when you go to a berit milah, the idea of this quote unquote God telling him, Eliyahu, you think everyone left the berit? Look, they're keeping the berit. God does not want the zealousness to be used to cause B'nai Israel to be killed. And I can prove that from our story in this week's Perasha. This week's Perasha says that God was zealous. Bekin ati, I was zealous. Belochiliti, and I didn't wipe them out because of Pinehas' zealotry. Pinhas' zealotry was to save B'nai Israel, not to kill them. So let's connect the dots now. This Midrash that says that Eliyahu is Pinhas. Our Eliyahu in Seven Melachim was asked to go through a process in order to become like our Pinhas. In order for Eliyahu Hanavi to become like the Pinchas of our Pirasha, the Midrash says he needs to attend every Berit Milah. And by attending every Berit Milah, Eliyahu eventually will become the Eliyahu Hanavi of Once Eliyahu Hanavi and again, I'm in no way saying anything about Eliyahu. People take that in the wrong way. Eliyahu was brought up in Esh to the Shamayim. He was too close to God to be able to be on the human realm, right? Similar to the Midrash, right? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when he comes out, very similar, right? The idea of burning people with your eyes. You have to be able to relate to the people, to be with the people. Eliyahu Hanavi, when he goes up, the way I look at that pedic, and I'll get to the question, I see someone raise their hand. The way I look at that pedic in Navi of going up in the Esh is a, is a total attachment to God who is Esh. And that attachment, in order for Eliyahu to quote unquote come back down to us, he has to attend our biritot. He has to see what's going right. And eventually, Eliyah Hanavi becomes veheshiv levavot albanim. He's willing to work with us to return us to God. That is, I think, this midrash of hu pinhas, hu Eliyahu. I'll venture to say, and I could be wrong, the midrash says hu pinhas, who Eliyahu, that's the goal that Eliyahu will get to. Again, not in a bad way. Eliyahu attached himself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But sometimes when you do that, it leads to burning, right, um, you know, others. Instead, we have this picture of Eliyahu who will bring shalom between Hashem and B'nai Yisrael. And that's the way I look at this Midrash. And I think it's an important Midrash to look at, to realize, you know, what is the goal of zealousness? What is the goal? You know, before I give that final message, um, I saw Lauren raise her hand, Tuni as well. Um, I just wanted to ask, based on the way you're describing um, Eliyahu, it would seem to me that Yahu is more similar to Moshe than Pinchas. Even though the word Kina is only with Pinchas, the way describing the, you know, face to face with God and the Esh and understanding and the forty days and forty nights. Well, the forty days and forty nights. Yeah, there's so much more parallel to Moshe. Good. I I, I would like to send you my article. I wrote an article on that actually a few years ago an article comparing Moshe and Eliyahu. And Eliyahu is, in terms of the way that he's depicted in Tanakh, he is one aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu. 
The difference is, Lauren, and I would argue, Moshe used his closeness with God on Har Sinai. When God passes over him, you know, the which is more similar to our story, because there also in this story, um, he's brought to a me'ara, right in there, it's, he's, he's, um, su- he's on a sur, he's by the rock, and God passes over him, and he covers him. There's a lot of similarity in those, those two stories. Lauren, what does Moshe do in that story when God passes over him? What, what does Moshe realize in that story about God? That God is compassionate and forgiving. And Moshe uses that episode to get God to forgive B'nai Israel. Eliyahu uses it on the reverse side to punish B'nai Israel. So it's actually, even with Moshe, he's contrasted. He's similar in terms of the episodes. And that's the same idea, I would say. Eliyahu was similar. Yeah. I think that it, this, this, the way the story in, in Eliyahu goes is it, it really trying to, to bring us to see, is Eliyahu going to behave like Moshe? Is he? And he doesn't. Right. And in the, the story, the way it starts, it's the comparison to Moshe, it, you can't, just can't miss it. And we expect right. him to change his behavior and be like right. Moshe and, and really ask Hashem to forgive the people and he's going to work with, it, with the people, with Hashem. But, but he doesn't. Okay, and, and that's that, the contrast. And that could be the way the Midrash gets to the point of Eliyahu being ongoing. The idea of going up in the ash and that we don't know what happens to him. And then eventually going through some sort of a process of he's so close to God. But sometimes being very close to God, there's two modes of leadership. When you're very close to God, and I think Tuni's question, when you're very close to God, you could be so close to God that you're so fired up that anyone who moves away from the path should be killed. And you're zealous and you want to hurt. It can't be. You're so hurt that God is being, you know, um, uh, stranded. Shimon and Abi is also hurt, right? When they reject God and they ask for a king, he's also very hurt. You're hurt. He's so hurt. The question is, what do you do with that hurt? Do you use that hurt to lead or do you use that hurt to, to, to oppose the people? And I want you to consider the word Navi. I think it was our Ralphie Tal who told me this word, Navi. A Navi is Lehavi. You bring the word of God to the people. Right? Mm-hmm. You bring God to the people and the people to God. You connect God with the people. You don't distance. Right? And so when Eliyahu distance, he gets distance from the people, but stays with God. He doesn't, he doesn't lose totally in a sense. Don't, don't get me wrong there. You know that there's an attachment to God there of a different level and a different order that happens with Eliyahu. It's of a different level. But it's not an ability to be with the people. It just doesn't function like that. Yes, Tuni. I just wanted to know when Rab Shimon Bar Yochai came out of the cave, and didn't he get sent back in? Hashem told him, "Go back in. You have to live with the people. You have to understand." Right. That's how, I look really at how Hanavi didn't have that command. Like he just went up. I, I, I'm not really familiar with what happened. But again, that's that's the point. A lot a lot of derasha is needed for that. Like even the Gemara itself, it's saying that he was burning people with his eyes. I look at that also as Agada. And you have to understand that that story is told in a certain way. Probably to compare it like Eliyahu. I think the Gemara there, I think it's in Daf Lamed Gimal and Masechet Shabbat, if I'm not mistaken. The Gemara there also says that when he started to be with the people, and I think he was building roads or he was with the people, I don't remember exactly. But when he started to be with the people, that, that ended of burning people with his eyes, you know, because we, we need leadership, leadership in order for it to succeed. You know, leadership needs to be not leading you're above the people, right? You're with the people, but you're also with God, which is tough, it's difficult. When you're someone who's godly and you're working according to the berit of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it sometimes gets very tough 
when people are not acting the way they should? And how do you lead if they don't want to listen? Or you look at them not wanting to listen. And how do you deal with that process? And I think Eliyahu is one viewpoint of the difficulty that Nevi'im had. He had a very big difficulty of dealing with that. Moshe, and the way Moshe dealt with it, or Pina has a different viewpoint of how they dealt with it. And ultimately the goal, and I'll go back to the beginning of the class, ultimately the goal is shalom. Ultimately the goal is gadol ha-shalom shenatan le because the Torah is shalom. And that was the purpose of the Eliyahu story. Kol demamadaka. Silent. It's, 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 it's more peaceful. It's not an earthquake or it's not the wind. It's not the fire even. Look, Eliyahu goes up in the fire. It's not the fire. Don't fight with fire. Right, you take it as a, as a parent, right? Parents, when, many times it's that difficulty of struggling between parenting with fire or parenting softly. And which one do you use? And how do you speak to children? As a teacher, it's very difficult as well. Which one do you use? And that struggle of which mode of leadership to use. The, the Midrash starts out, the Midrash on Pirashah Pinchas, the Midrash Rabbah, with Gadol HaShalom. Peace should be the ultimate goal, even if sometimes we'll need to, to use some means like Pinchas used. The goal needs to be peace. Now that becomes very hard to distinguish. And that's why God needed to say, Pinchas, you get Shalom. Because otherwise we wouldn't know what his motives were. So I want to thank everyone for joining today for the SCA class on reading the Perasha through Midrashic Lens. Uh, I really hope you join us every week. Uh, I'm hoping to find a nice, nice Midrashim like this. But really, the Midrash is full of Midrashim. There's such beautiful messages. As long as we're willing to delve in and to look at the Midrashim with this deeper eye, think about how much time we spent and a couple of lines in Midrash, few lines in Midrash, how much time we need to invest to really understand every Midrash that we read. That's what the Rambam refers to as the gems of Hazal, the beauty of Hazal, the beauty of Midrashim.